Although the first life originated somewhere between 4.5 and 3.7 billion years ago, multicellular life did not appear on our planet until much, much later. About 600 million years is the generally accepted limit for the earliest multicellular organisms, although there have been reports of evidence for even older ones in recent years. So how come it took so long for multicelled life to evolve? Why did it even develop in the first place, since single-celled creatures are clearly successful anyway? How many times did it evolve throughout history? These are the mysteries of life. We first need to define what exactly is meant by multicellularity. Although the broad definition is an organism made up of more than one cell, this could mean two things. Firstly, it could be referring to a cluster of cells that might travel around with each other, but don't really interact as a single organism. Alternatively, it could mean a multicellular organism in a more conventional sense, with all the cells in a group actually cooperating with each other. And so, depending on the definition, the number of organisms that are actually considered multicellular can differ. However, whichever definition you go with, there is no doubt that multicellular life has evolved many times from independent branches on the evolutionary tree. But what actually triggered this huge step in evolution to take place in such a wide range of different organisms? There must be some sort of advantage to being multicelled, otherwise everything would have just stayed as single cells. Well, a part of it has to do with the problem of surface area and volume. Anyone familiar with biology will be aware of this principle, which shows that as the size of an organism increases, its surface area to volume ratio decreases. This causes all sorts of problems for the organism, since it will be unable to absorb enough nutrients or move them throughout their body effectively enough to survive. And this would have been a major issue for large single-celled organisms, but multicellular life could have overcome the problem with an increase in relative surface area, allowing larger organisms to evolve. And this is not the only advantage to being multicelled. Multicellular organisms are generally far more complex than single-celled life, featuring many different types of cells that perform a range of functions, all contained within one organism. Animals especially have a very large number of specialised cells compared to other groups of living things. And this complexity and large number of cells also allows a much longer lifespan for multicellular organisms, because even when a few cells die, the larger organism they are a part of can go on surviving for a significantly longer time. The switch from unicellularity to multicellularity has occurred several times in as many as 25 different places in the tree of life, going by the definition of multicellularity that is just a grouping of cells that move around together. However, if we stick to the less inclusive definition of a group of cells that all work together, then it has still evolved a surprisingly high number of times in different organisms. Multicellularity has arisen on many occasions in bacteria, although many members of this group are still single-celled. Obviously, it has also arisen in plants, animals, fungi and algae. In animals it has only arisen once, but in fungi it has appeared on three separate occasions and six times in algae. The reason for why this certain arrangement has emerged so many times is to do with how evolution operates. As we have already seen, multicellularity grants a lot of advantages to the organisms that can achieve it, and so it's not really that unexpected that we see it repeatedly and independently evolve. The same effect of having many cells group together and coordinate can be accomplished through various different evolutionary pathways, and if they work, then they'll stay around. There might be differences in the chemical makeup of what the different organisms are using to stick their cells together, and there could be completely different developmental processes that occur, but if, in the end, there is a group of cells that can stick together and function as a single organism, then natural selection will allow it to remain as a working method to achieve multicellularity. So we've seen why multicellularity can be a good thing to evolve, and we've seen that it has appeared several times in different groups. But just how did it evolve? What was the process that led to the very first multicelled creatures developing? We're going to focus on three main theories, all of which have varying levels of support for and against them. This first theory states that the earliest multicellular organisms could have originated when different, single-celled species came together to form a cohesive, cooperating entity. It considers the possibility that these species gained a mutual advantage from working together, and so eventually formed multicelled structures. 
This certainly seems like a fairly plausible explanation, seeing as there are organisms alive today such as lichen, which are actually composed of different species working together. Lichen are made up of a fungus which supplies the necessary nutrients, and also contain an alga or bacterium that photosynthesize. But the fungi and algae or bacteria in a lichen don't share the same genetic code. They are still distinct species, but simply live in a symbiotic relation with each other. And this is the main problem that faces the symbiotic theory. How could two or more very separate genetic codes have become one, when there is no such trace of this happening? This must have happened if multiple species were to become one, but there is simply no evidence suggesting this occurred. This issue makes the symbiosis theory seem fairly unlikely to have been the way multicellularity arose. So what alternatives are there? One alternative is the xenocytic theory. Xenocytes are cells that possess multiple nuclei within their membranes, and this theory suggests that a process leading to multicellularity went through a stage where the cells became xenocytes. This development towards multicellularity would have started with a normal cell with a single nucleus, failing to completely divide when it reproduced, and forming a cell that contained several nuclei. After this had happened, membranes would have formed between the multiple nuclei, establishing individual cells, and so a multicellular organism was created. After a period of time, the theory indicates that some of the newly formed cells would have begun to differentiate, making various kinds of useful cells, including ones used for reproduction. Support for this theory includes the fact that there are examples of organisms alive today that possess multiple nuclei, so we know that this sort of development is indeed possible. As well as this, there is also some evidence that supports the idea that multiple cells can originate from a single cell with multiple nuclei. But a problem with the theory is that it would involve a fairly complicated transition from single-celled to xenocyte to multi-celled, instead of just single to multi-celled. In addition to this, it also does not provide much explanation for how the behaviour of selfish cells is reduced. This behaviour occurs when certain cells in a group do not give out any energy themselves to benefit the whole organism, but instead gain much of the molecules and nutrients from the other cells, causing harm to the organism as those particular cells grow the most. This brings us to the final theory we will be looking at, the colonial theory. This idea is considered by some to be the most plausible explanation for the origin of multicellular life, since it has a great deal of evidence in its favour. It is essentially similar to the symbiotic theory, but instead of different species coming together to form an organism, this idea proposes that single-celled members of the same species stuck to each other to form multicellular creatures. There are two main ways that this could have happened. It could have been due to one cell that divided to form two daughter cells which then did not properly separate, causing a colony of joined cells to develop from them. Or, it could have been down to already separate cells of the same species coming together to mutually benefit from one another, and forming a colony this way. Once the colonies were established, the theory suggests that certain cells would then have differentiated to perform various functions, including reproduction. There is much support for this theory, such as the existence of colonial organisms today that show how such a stage in evolution could very plausibly have occurred. There is also the benefit of kin selection that would happen if the colonies were made from a single cell that did not separate once divided. This evolutionary strategy means that an organism may act in an altruistic manner in order to ensure the survival of its close relatives. And if the first colonies originated from a single cell, then they would be very closely related, encouraging this sort of behaviour. And there are also other clear benefits to living in a colony that would immensely enhance the chance of the survival of organisms, such as improved defence from predators, making it seem highly probable that this arrangement could have developed as an intermediate stage between unicellularity and multicellularity. However, the colonial theory does not seem to offer a clear explanation for how selfish cell behaviour is reduced in the very first stages of the development of the organism, before cells that can reproduce are made. This is the same problem that the xenocytic theory has. And this brings us very nicely into the next section of this video. Although the colonial theory is fairly compelling, it still faces a problem, and this problem has an impact on many multicellular organisms alive today. As we have already discussed previously, selfish cell behaviour can cause serious harm to an organism by using up a lot of its energy and resources just so that one or a small group of cells can benefit. In many groups of multicellular animals, this still happens. 
it's called cancer. When a few cells stop properly controlling their growth, and begin to demand more resources and energy than they should be using, it causes a great deal of problems for the organism. And if it's still present in living things today, then this sort of issue would have been happening millions of years ago to the first colonial organisms. But obviously somewhere along the way this problem was overcome to a level where multicellularity could evolve, and the benefits of being able to grow to larger sizes and being better protected from predators mostly outweighed the risk of selfish cell behaviour leading to cancer. So to conclude, organisms became multicellular various times throughout the many diverse branches of life because it offered them a large number of advantages over being single-celled. These advantages were then naturally selected by the processes of evolution and have led to a huge array of biodiversity possessing incredibly unique and fascinating body plans that would not have been able to evolve without multicellularity being developed first. We're still not entirely certain of just how the very first single-celled creatures became multicelled, but as we have seen in this video, there are several theories that provide the basis for an explanation. As more evidence mounts in the coming years, we may develop a much more coherent understanding of the exact details of this stage in evolution, and I'm excited to see what the future holds in terms of research into this mystery of life. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. If you would like to learn more about our world and explore more of the mysteries of life, please feel free to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the rest of this series.